thank you for choosing CTN. And now, it's time with Herman and Sharon. I love you. Yeah, thank everybody. you so much. We've got the boom camera. See when it comes down? There it is right there. It goes boom. Hello, boom. <laughs> How are you, boom? Good to meet you, boom. Sue is behind the boom. Yes, she is. Uh, this is my wife, mm -hmm. Sharon. 58 oh, okay. years all right. this year. <laughs> 58 years. I know all you folks that are watching think maybe she's 58 years old. Right. That right. would be kind of tough since we've been married for 58 years, almost in May. Yeah, it's not quite yet. I'm hanging on to the 57. I know. I know. If you and I uh, get a couple more colds, we'll just check I out. I know. We keep passing it back and forth to each I other. I know. And I promised her I wouldn't give it to her. She got it. Yeah. And I was, and I was trying We're everything. We're doing all right, though. Everything within me. It's great to have brilliance. <laughs> because yes, the smarter the people around me, the smarter I look. So there's a method to my whole science here. But I want you to take a look at this little clip. And when we come back, you will meet this phenomenal man. Watch. You are one person on a planet. There are eight planets in our solar system with over 20 billion Earth-like worlds in our galaxy and more than four sextillion galaxies in the universe. Is your life merely the result of a series of coincidences? Or is there another explanation? How many planets fit the requirements for life, such as the just right amount of water, oxygen, sunlight, gravity, tidal waves, gas giants, ultraviolet, What if Earth was created with you in mind. The Improbable Planet, How Earth Became Humanity's Home. Meet Dr. Hugh Ross. He's a astronomer with a PhD from the University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And he is the founder and president of Reason to Believe. He has authored several books we're going to talk about one today and spoken on more than 300 campuses in the United States of America abroad on a variety of science and faith topics. What an honor to have yes, you again. I got to show you a picture because I'm so proud of my grandson. I, I don't know who's going to get this, Matthew or somebody? Can we get a close up on this picture right here? There you are. Good. That's a good shot. Justin, my grandson, our grandson. Thank you. <laughs> Last time we were on, he was sitting where you are, right? That's right. And uh, Dr. Hugh Ross. Now, Justin, our grandson, is uh, philosophy major, and he's studying it and going for his degrees. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking about him. But he's trying to work his way through college rather than working up a great big financial tab so that when he finally gets his Ph.D., he's got... Grandpa, I've got a $100,000 bill here. What do I do with this? But so good to have you. Well, thank you for inviting me back. You've been all over the place since the last time. Yes. A lot of Just travel. came from Washington, D.C., you said. Yes. Wow. Wow, and speaking. Yeah. That's great. And I just had his good friend. Remember this guy? I'm <laughs> sure you watched the program. I hope you have. But, Kenneth uh, Samples. Yeah. God Amon Sages. And, and uh, he's... Part of your group? Yeah, he's the philosopher on our staff at Reasons to Believe. Wow. One of our philosophers. So. How, how many? Well, we have, uh, let's see, we have six uh, staff scholars, but we have about 40 uh, visiting scholars, and then there's a team of a couple of hundred other scholars that volunteer for us. Now, do you, do you, do you give them a Brainiac test before you hire them? <laughs> uh, no, I mean... We do make sure they can sign our doctrinal statement yeah. that they are have a we, we have a Christian behavior statement. We'll make sure they live the life because our whole theme is you want to have good reasons for the hope that you have in Jesus Christ, yeah. mm -hmm. but the demeanor to share it with gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience. So we want to make sure that that's, that's so there. important, isn't it? That right. gentleness, the way you share. And we it. want to make sure our scientists also have really deep Bible knowledge. That's right. Because if, if you give good defense scientifically for the Christian faith, you're going to get Bible and theology questions. 
So you want to be prepared in both. That's what I love about you. I mean, with the knowledge that you have actually been blessed by God because mm -hmm. he made all this possible and you're using it for him and reaching people that probably would never be reached other than being able to discuss things with you and then all of a sudden they're going. What's the heart of all of our people? What can we do to bring people who don't know Christ into a relationship with the creator of the universe? Amen. Were you always interested in science even growing up as a yes, child? Yes, I mean from the age of seven onwards I knew astrophysics would be my future career. Really? I mean uh, my parents were worried that I was obsessed about astronomy and physics because I, I would come home with five books from the public library on astronomy and physics every week. Uh, I remember when I was about ten and a half they bought me this big thick book on evolution and biology just so I would read something besides astronomy and physics. And uh, that book actually had a factor because I remember telling my parents, Mom and Dad, the numbers don't add up. We have all the speciation <laughs> before humanity and we don't have much afterwards. And I said, can you tell me why? They couldn't. They said, go to the library. The books I read didn't answer it either. It was an enigma that bothered me until I picked up the Bible for a serious read for the first wow. time. When I read Genesis 1, I said, this answers the fossil record enigma. For six days God creates on the seventh day he stops, he rests from his work of creation. So it explains why we see all the speciation in the past because that's when God's creating and we don't see it today because we're in the seventh day. Uh, this is the day that God rests from his work of creation to focus on his spiritual work of bringing people into relationship with him. Wow. Improbable Planet is a sequel to why the universe is the way it is. Yes. Yeah, I wrote that book back in 2008. And this book actually stems from a, a Bible study I did, because I'm also a pastor. And I was teaching this class on the different creation texts in the Bible, and there's dozens of them. And what I noted is that all these texts consistently link the doctrine of creation with the doctrine of redemption. And then there are some passages that actually state that God begins his works of redemption before he creates anything. I said, well, this implies that everything God creates is for the purpose of bringing billions of human beings into a relationship with him that's free of sin. So I says, I'm going to put that to the test. So I spent three years surveying the scientific literature, reading journals in all different disciplines. And this book is the result of that uh, three-year study. If, if I were in first grade with you, let's turn back time. Mm -hmm. Would I look at you as brilliant? No, you wouldn't. No, Why? not in any way. Why? Well, I didn't know it back then, but today I know I'm on the autistic spectrum. And, uh, you know, growing up with my parents, I wasn't speaking. I had problems with fine motor skills, and all my parents' friends said, your son's mentally retarded. He needs to be put into an institution. Uh, my parents adamantly said, no way, we're not doing that. Uh, but I remember going into grade one. I couldn't hold a pencil, I couldn't make letters or numbers, and I wasn't speaking, and uh, so I was failing all my classes. So in you grade would be one. in the back of the class? Yeah, I was headed for repeating grade one. However, my parents uh, moved us from one house to another house, and so I was in a different school for the last six weeks. And there was a grade one teacher there. Her name was Lila Campbell. You never forgot that, did you? Never forgot that. Because what she did, uh, with one week to go in the school year, she says, I want you to stay after school. And she said, you don't have to speak. Just nod your head for yes and shake your head for no. I'm going to ask you questions about these books. She had 30 books on her desk. She figured out I had read those books. So she says, I'm going to pass you into grade two, even though you're failing everything. And so over the summer, I would spend one to two hours a day practicing how to make numbers and letters with a pencil. So when I got into grade two, I was still a lot slower than the other uh, pupils, but at least I could start making letters and numbers, which meant I could actually show people I could do the arithmetic. And then I said, I'm going to force myself to talk. And when you're on the autistic spectrum, one reason why a lot of them don't talk is not that they can't talk, is when they do talk, they say things that get them into trouble. 
And so, you know, as a little boy, I says, I better keep my mouth shut, otherwise I'm going to get into trouble. How is that? What, what, because your mind is brilliant? Well, you're blunt. Uh, so I would say things like, Mom, Dad, that lady's really fat. And they'd okay. say, you can't say that. <laughs> uh, or I'd say, that man smells. And he says, you can't say that. So I'd say, I better not say anything. Mm. Um, and but in grade two, I said I'm going to start talking. And they actually in Canada at that time, where you sat in the classroom depended on your academic standing. So I started grade two in the last chair in the classroom, and all the other kids were you know ridiculing me as a class dummy. And I said there's no way I'm going to be in this last chair by the time grade two is over. So. Uh, through a lot of work and reading, by the end of grade two, I was in the first chair. My goodness. That's and that's amazing. when uh, they introduced me. I mean, in grade two, in grade one, we were kept away from the library. Grade two, they showed us the library. And that's when I got fascinated with science. And then uh, our grade two teacher noticed how much I was enjoying the reading. He says, well, how about if we do a field trip to the big library? Uh, the Vancouver Public Library had three million volumes. So she showed us how to take the buses to get there. And every Saturday, I would go to the public library and come home with five books on astronomy and physics, read them, and go back the next Saturday and get five more. And uh, that's And you what retained what you were reading? I really was fascinated by what I was reading. Wow. And, uh, and I knew that was going to be my future career. I began to look at specialized subdisciplines uh, uh, sub within astronomy. And that's what persuaded me that there had to be a God. I mean, I was not raised in a Christian home, but through my astronomy, I realized the universe has to have a beginning. And if there's a beginning, there's a beginner. And I want to find out who that beginner is. And I first looked for the beginner in the philosophers. So I was looking at uh, Immanuel Kant and Descartes and other philosophers, and said, they got the astronomy wrong. I'm going to look elsewhere. So I looked at the Hindu Vedas, the Buddhist commentaries, and eventually, uh, I picked up a Bible. And I really didn't get to know Christians personally until I was about 27. But I did see two Christians from 30 feet away when I was 11 <laughs> years of age. And uh, they were Gideons that came into our public school. Oh, yeah. Put boxes on our teacher's desk. They didn't say anything. No words came out of them. But I picked up a Gideon Bible. And six years later, I started to read it. Wow. And I was studying that Gideon Bible for over a two-year period that persuaded me this book actually predicts future scientific discoveries. It never makes a mistake. Wow. This has to be the inspired message from the one that actually created the universe. And so I wound up signing my name on the back of that Gideon Bible and giving my life to Jesus Christ. Wow. Isn't that great? Oh. What a wonderful story. Cold chills going I up know. and down my neck, okay? Well, it also helped me with my autism because I said, Committing my life to Jesus Christ is committing to share the story of how, what Christ has done in my life. Mm -hmm. So I said, I've got to start talking to people about what's happened to me. Well, you're a great hope for, for parents that have autistic children. Well, I speak a lot to uh, parents who have autistic children and say, if they're high functioning, what you need to do is find out what they're really good at. Uh, and everybody on the spectrum is different from everybody else. They'll have a gift. That's distinct. Some are musicians, right? Exactly. So, so you need to find out what that distinct gift is. And the way you do it, you expose your child to advanced material. Wow. Material, let's say, 10 grade levels above where they are. Really? And just do that in different subjects and something will hit. And then you can encourage them to develop in that area. Great information. Yeah. So. Why Ask Why, Chapter 1, Are We a Launch Pad for the New Creation to Come? Well, that was the theme of why the universe is the way it is, that what's distinct about Christianity, it's a two-creation model. God creates his universe as a means to eliminate evil and suffering while enhancing the free will of people who choose to form a relationship with him. And uh, what I write about in this book is, remember I said earlier how I did that three-year study of the scientific literature? What I discovered is every component of the universe every star, every galaxy, every atom of hydrogen, and every component of the Earth and Earth's life, and every event that happens in the universe, Earth and Earth's life, plays a role in making possible the redemption of billions of human beings 
in a short period of time. Wow. So the whole book, it basically takes you through. So I start with the universe, bring it to the earth, then we look at the history of life uh, on planet earth and say, yeah, every event, every component is critical to make possible the redemption of billions of human beings. You talk about in this book, three creations of life. Yes. Meaning? Well, okay. Uh, I, with my colleague, Fuzz Rana, our staff biochemist, we wrote a book on the origin of life which focus on the origin of physical life. And that's creation day one, uh, where God creates the first physical life form. But if you read on in Genesis one, by creation day five, God creates life that's not only physical, but life that's physical and soulish. Referring to the birds and mammals that form emotional relationships with one another. Uh, they had the ability to form emotional relationships with us human beings. They have mind, they have will, uh, you can train them. Uh, and then the third one is we human beings who are not only physical and soulish, we're also spiritual. Or I could put it another way, God created the soulish animals to serve and please a higher species and to form a relationship with a higher species, namely us human beings. He created us human beings to serve and please a higher being and to form a relationship with that higher being, namely the creator of everything. That's why it says in Job, look to the birds and look to the beasts of the field, they'll teach you. Because just like they were created to serve a higher species, we were created to serve a higher being. You say the universe is not static. Yes, it's expanding. Uh, the Bible tells us in 11 different places that we live in a universe that's expanding, how God stretches out the heavens. Now, now, expanding like we think of expanding, like a balloon blowing it up? Well, yes, but uh, keep in mind we're talking a 10-dimensional system, not just a three-dimensional system. So it's, don't try to visualize it. Okay. It can't be done. <laughs> uh, but our measurements tell us, yes, the universe started off, excuse me, infinitesimally small, yeah. and it's been expanding ever since. And now we realize that the expansion is accelerating. Every year that goes by, the universe expands at a faster rate. Is that why they're finding more stars and more, it seems like they, they say they found more planets or another whole universe out there? Well, yeah, they found a whole group of planets. Yeah. They say that it's like the Earth. Well, I've actually written an article on it. You'll see that in my Facebook page because NASA got all excited about these seven planets. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, these are all habitable. They only looked at the water habitable zone, the zone where liquid water is possible. And you'll see a chapter in this book where I talk about nine different habitable zones. And for a planet to yeah. be truly habitable, it must simultaneously reside in all nine habitable zones. And they are? Well, you got the water habitable zone, the ultraviolet habitable zone, the photosynthetic habitable zone, you got the electric wind habitable zone, it goes on. So it has oh to be goodness. in that family. <clears throat> yeah, a planet must reside simultaneously in all those nine zones. Mm. For the vast majority of planets, you might have the water habitable zone here, and you got the ultraviolet habitable zone here. If they don't overlap, yeah. it's not habitable. Mm -hmm. Now of all the thousand, and the water habitable zone is the widest. And what I tell people is the universe is sloppy wet. Uh, water is the third most abundant molecule in the universe. So I'm not surprising that we're finding all these planets that can conceivably have liquid water on them. But of all the planets we've discovered, we've discovered over 3,500 of them, there's only one that simultaneously resides in all nine habitable zones. And you can guess which one that is. Yeah. God made that possible? Is that, is, is that something that you can, say, say a person that said, there is no God, Sagan, you know, the, the, this, this just happened. Can that come out as truth, well, that this wasn't an accident? That's the theme of this book, is that, you know, the universe must be exactly the size that it is, the mass that it is, the age that it is, so that we could exist here on planet Earth. The whole universe exists to make life habitable on this one planet. Uh, our galaxy must be exactly the way it is. 
I mean, I had a problem watching the Star Wars movies because they talk about a galaxy far, far away. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, we've looked far, far away, and they don't have the right characteristics for advanced life. Our Milky Way is unique. Yeah. Our solar system is unique. But they say this Earth is dying, and that's why we have to find somewhere else to live. Or well, they're right no about humans. that. I mean, what's interesting, what I write about in this book is that we have this long history of life on planet Earth, and thank God that we do because that builds up the bio deposits we need to establish a global civilization. But we're at the end of the window of time for life here on planet Earth. But I end the book by pointing out there's good news. That means that God is ready to take us from this creation to the new creation. Because the promise is the moment that the full number of humans that God intends to redeem have been redeemed, that's in Romans chapter eight, then the role of this universe will have been completed. His purpose will be finished. And God will replace this universe with a brand new creation. New heaven, new earth. New so heavens and why, new earth, right. That's why the unbelievers are getting so desperate. Well, they realize, because scientists now recognize the window of time is gonna come yeah. to a close very rapidly. How old are we, this earth? This earth, 4.5662 billion years, plus or minus 0. 0.0001. <laughs> we know it to five places the decimal. Are you glad you asked? <laughs> I, I, I'm visualizing this. And life has been here for 3.825 billion years, and that's what you see in Psalm 104, how God packs our planet with as much life as mm. possible, as diverse as possible, and as long as possible. Why? Because God wants human beings, when he creates them, to already have available the resources they need to quickly launch and sustain global civilization. It's thanks to global civilization that we can take the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ to all the people groups of the world, not mm. millions of years, but only thousands of years. And I close the book off saying, we're close to seeing the fulfillment of Romans 8.23. You, you just blew the young earth people that are watching. <laughs> apart. Now, how do you marry that Well, something I saw with when, yours? Okay, when I first picked up the Bible at age 17, I noticed that uh, this word day must have at least three distinct literal definitions. Uh, because when it talks about creation day one, it's contrasting days and nights. That's day, the word day referring to the daylight hours. Creation day four, it's contrasting seasons, days, and years. That's day for 24 hours. But Genesis 2, 4 uses the word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. That's day as a long How period of time. How do you know time. that? How do you know that? It's right there in the English text. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to know Hebrew. It's right there in the English. You can get that in any translation of the Bible. So that tells you right away there must be at least three distinct literal definitions if you pick up a Hebrew lexicon, you discover there are four. It can also mean part of the daylight hours. So as I was reading through it, I says, well, I noticed these creation days are bracketed by an evening and a morning, which means each day has a definite start point and a definite end point. And I thought there would be an evening and a morning for the seventh day. There isn't. There's no evening and morning for day seven. And remember I told you earlier that answered the fossil record enigma? because we're still in the seventh day. I read on in the Bible and said there are three passages, Psalm 95, Hebrews 4, and John 5, that state that we're still in God's seventh day. So it's not yet finished, which means we're talking about the seventh day being a long period of time. So I tell my young earth friends, I have no problem signing a doctrinal statement that God created in six literal days but the word day in Hebrew has four distinct literal definitions. And we need to read the Bible literally and consistently to see which of those definitions applies to the creation days. And I'm persuaded that it's six consecutive, non-overlapping, long periods of time, in which case there's no contradiction with the established scientific record. You talk about the moon's marvelous mass. Yes. Why? Well. The earth, I mean, it tells us in the Bible that at the beginning, uh, the earth was dark. Water covered the whole surface of the earth and was dark on the surface of the waters. And if you go to Job 38, it explains why it's dark. 
It's dark because God blanketed the seas with clouds that kept the seas dark. So it wasn't dark because there was no light in the universe. The universe was filled with light, but it was dark because the clouds wouldn't let light through. And being a, a young astronomy student, I knew that the thickness of a planet's atmosphere depended on how massive this, the planet was and how far away it was from its star. So I knew the Earth must have begun with an atmosphere 100 times thicker than what it has today. But it's the moon forming event. This planet called Thea, which collided with the Earth, slow collision in a deep ocean that caused Earth to lose all of its water and all of its atmosphere. But then there was a veneer of comets that replaced it with a thin atmosphere and a thin layer of water, which made advanced life possible on a planet. You have to have a planet as big as ours uh, in order to have advanced life, but you need a thin atmosphere and you need a thin layer of water, and it's thanks to the moon forming event that we have exactly the atmosphere and the water layer uh, that we need. And what's interesting is we're finding Earth-like planets where we can measure the water content. The water content is 500 times greater than we see in our planet, which means you would never get continents. So, and there's actually, I have to write about how scientists have looked at the moon forming event and said, there's way too much fine tuning design. We got to redo the models. They redid the models and guess what happened? Even more fine tuning design. And these papers were published in the British journal Nature where one of the researchers said, this is causing us philosophical disquiet. All this fine tuning design we're getting. <laughs> and that, I said, well, of course, because they're not acknowledging that God was behind it. That's what's causing the, the philosophical disquiet. My goodness. Yes. I know. Yeah, we, we could spend uh, three or four hours <laughs> <laughs> and just scratch the surface of literally going Great through book. this book. You, you have to get your copy. I'm telling you, you will be, uh, it just fascinates me. I mean, you can get so involved in this kind of thing, and then you open the Word of God and read it because he, you know, he references the Word of God. It is just, it's just like the, the last guest that I have. These two guys are companions, and I mean, it's amazing. Well, but, every chapter I document miracles yes. that we've discovered in the past few yes. years. Yeah. Yes, and things are changing. Yes, yes, I mean, what excites me by being the president of Reasons to Believe and reading the scientific literature, every day new science papers are published that give us a stronger case for our Christian wow. faith. Wow. That's wow. something. Dave, can you put this on the screen one more? Oh, there, there's the website. Go to the website. Yeah. Get, there it is. Thanks, Dave. Uh, get your copy. I'm <laughs> telling you, you will thank Hugh Ross. You will thank me for having Hugh Ross on so many times. But I, I am blessed just to know him. And uh, if you don't know the author of this book, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, call on him today. He will transform your life. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching It's Time. If you have recently made a decision for Christ, Herman and Sharon would like to hear from you.